Hello and welcome to this year's British Pharmacological Society Winter Meeting 2010. I'm here with Dr. Roland Jones from the University of Bath uh, following his MSD lecture on anti-epileptic drugs, uh, a synaptic balancing act, is that right? That's right, yes indeed. Excellent, so if you could just start by telling us a little bit about your background. Right, okay, um, I'm a journeyman pharmacologist. I started life as a pharmacologist in the University of Bradford in the early 70s and then did my PhD in Cardiff, um, University College Cardiff, and sort of started then neuro work on neuropharmacology, which has been my um, area of interest and research ever since. Um, after my PhD, I went around the world for 12 years. I had a postdoc in Canada, um, moved back to Europe and worked at Sibagaygi as it was then, Novartis as it is now, in Basel in Switzerland. Um, moved to Germany for a year to the Max Planck Institute, set off to Australia, spent three and a half years there before I actually finally came back to the UK in 1990 and since then I was in Oxford for six years, um, Bristol in physiology in Bristol for eight years and I've been in Bath since 2004 so I've been around the block a bit and <laughs> done lots of interesting things, seen lots of interesting places. Yeah. Excellent, that sounds brilliant. And you start off looking at antidepressant drugs, is that right? That's right, yes. My PhD was looking at mechanism of action of antidepressants mm. um, and then when I went off doing my postdoc years I sort of dabbled with it on and off for quite a while um, in Canada and in Switzerland um, but when I went to Germany um, I sort of had a sort of step backwards and had a look at what I was doing and what I was interested in and it seemed to me like the antidepressant field was not actually progressing very much yeah. um, so I thought well it's time for a change and all my work up until then had been um, in vivo uh, electrophysiology so I decided I'd have a change and I'd started using in vitro brain slice preparations and looking then at anticonvulsants rather than antidepressants because the, the guy I went to work with in Germany was interested yeah. in epilepsy and anticonvulsants. So it was a, a conscious choice to make that change yeah. at that time and that was around about 1986 I guess. So, yeah. And since then you've focus mainly on the anti-epileptic Yes, yeah. What, what we're interested in mostly is the basic mechanisms underlying generation of epileptic activity mm. in nerve networks, um, but all the time thinking, well, how does that influence how the available drug treatments work and how, mm. by further understanding it, we can develop better anticonvulsant treatments. Yeah, so that's what we're doing now and that's what we've been doing since about mid-80s, I guess, in one way or another. So if we could step back, I think I found particularly interesting in your lecture, just talking about the history of epilepsy as a disease and how it's been kind of seen through the ages. Can mm -hmm. you talk us through that a little? Yeah, I, until relatively recently, and I'm talking about the 1800s really, it was really seen as a spiritual disorder. Um, um, and a mental spiritual disorder in that people were mad, they were possessed by spirits, it was some sort of magical disease. Um, and it wasn't until the 1800s that we really started to, to um, think of it as a physical disorder, as some, something going wrong in the brain causing it to happen. Um, but yes, many, many years it was, it was seen as a, some sort of possession yeah. spirits to be exorcised and as I said in, in the lecture you know exorcism was um, really a, a, a treatment that was widely employed to treat epileptic patients or try and treat them obviously it didn't work I don't think very often but uh, but yeah so it, it had that history and it had a very you know, stigma attached to it as a, a, a mental disease people were mad yeah. you know. And presumably that relates to the the kind of the obvious external symptoms yeah. of epilepsy. Yes, yeah, they were possessed and they fell down and thrashed around because the spirits didn't want them to do something or wanted them to do something that, and they were fighting against it and yeah. and that that's how it was seen. Yes, very much so. But there are other symptoms I think of epilepsy that are less well known. 
Yeah, people, and I, I, I always stress this to people about epilepsy, is that when I talk about epilepsy, everybody thinks of that, you know, people mm. falling down, having a fit, yeah. you know, losing consciousness. But you know, I showed on the slide there that many of the drugs are treat, used for different epileptic syndromes, mm. and, you know, the majority of them do not actually show that external symptom of, yeah. of, of you know long duration fits you know, you've got absence seizures for example in children very prevalent in children which are often misdiagnosed as daydreaming when they're in in class because they they simply they are actually losing consciousness but yeah. only for about three or four seconds and it's just okay. a blankness essentially that comes over them and staring eyes no blinking only for about five or six seconds and then they come back and that's a, you know a full generalized what we call a generalized seizure involving the whole of your cerebral cortex for four or five seconds. But can that often go undiagnosed then? Because it does, yeah, it is actually seen in it's particularly in young kids. It, yeah. it you know, takes some time for them to real for to people to realize that they are actually have a problem yeah. and that they're not just dreaming and yeah. thinking, oh, I'm bored now. You know? <laughs> um, so yes, it is a problem in in with absence seizures, you know. so very different types of epilepsy with different Definitely. manifestations, yes. But do these all tend to have, to our understanding, similar causes, and that's what you To some extent, yes, but you know, the, a large number of epilepsies, and I would say the majority, I think, uh, have no known cause, what we call cryptogenic, so hidden okay. cause, or you know, idiopathic um, syndrome yeah. and essentially that, that's just fancy words for saying we don't we understand don't what what's underlying all this there are lots of obvious causes like brain damage um, occurring during birth you know okay. if you if you sort of deprived of oxygen during yeah. birth then that quite often results in in epileptic activity later in life head injury car crash okay. you know bang your head and, and that's a common cause all kinds of metabolic disorders associated with seizures but as I say, by and large, most of them have no obvious and we cause. we just don't understand where and they we, come from. We don't understand where they, can, they come from. Okay. So we covered some quite interesting uh, remedies that have been used through the ages, mm. um, I think linked with what you were saying about where it was believed that epilepsy came from. Yeah. Can we talk a little about that? Yes, yeah, well, it's my one of my favourite bits of talking about it is having a bit of fun and talking about the treatments that have mm. been used throughout the ages and as we've already mentioned exorcism getting rid of your evil spirits and and going back to the ancient Greeks where they thought it for example that you could get epilepsy by offending the moon gods and so in order to cure your epilepsy you had to go off to the temple and make a sacrifice to the moon gods and appease them and and they take your epilepsy away from you um, all sorts of things like that over the ages and you get into sort of more physical treatments that have been mm. employed and like um, drinking blood and drinking blood from fallen gladiators was one of the ones I showed showed on the slides there but there are also other related things and blood was seen as some, somehow important mm. to treatment of epilepsy for a long time animal blood human blood um, so these are all weird treatments that have been tried and you know, I mentioned extracts of plants, poisonous plants, but if you look at what the pharmacological constituents of those plants is, you can actually see sometimes some genuine pharmacology yeah. behind it and you think, well, we know this substance is in, in this plant and if you think about it, it it's actually quite logical the pharmacology makes yeah. a bit of sense there so I include that on my list of weird treatments but yeah. sometimes it's not so weird you know. so do you think there's a possibility some of these things may have had effect particularly maybe the plants that have you know we now know have active kind of chemical components yeah, they may absolutely. Have, yes. have worked yeah. to some extent although maybe yeah. not and belladonna was one of the ones I had on my list and, yeah. you know lots of atropine in belladonna yeah. um, and we know that if you look at nerve networks, that if you stimulate acetylcholine receptors, you can actually elicit synchronized seizure-like activity in nerve networks. So it may be that the high concentrations of atropine mm. in the belladonna were actually somehow involved in an anticonvulsant, a pharmacological anticonvulsant okay. effect. So there was some, some logic 
to some of those treatments yeah. there. And moving on, can you just sort of sketch out what's kind of believed now to be a sort of understanding of what is the kind of the molecular basis behind epilepsy? You, you can pick up any textbook and it will list, it will try and force all the anticonvulsants we've got mm. into specific categories like blocking sodium channels, therefore oh. blocking action potential, stopping cells communicating with each other, um, or increasing excitatory communication with glutamate between neurons or um, de sorry decreasing glutamate transmission or increasing GABA transmission and people try valiantly to force all the drugs we have into these categories and and the way we've been looking at it in the last few years is that it, it that's almost a pointless exercise okay. because every drug you take you're given a tablet and you take it and half an hour later that drug is everywhere in your neuronal network. Yeah. If you look at the pharmacology of any of these drugs they're very very dirty you know they'll attack lots of different ion channels they'll attack different aspects of glutamate and GABA systems and you can demonstrate it experimentally in lots of situations so the way we've been sort of thinking about it is that it's not so important what the molecular targets are here as to what they actually do to excitability within an intact network and that's that's really what we've been the message we've been trying to get across here okay. um, and so rather than sort of getting sort of more and more reductionist mm. and looking at individual molecular components we've yeah. been going back the other way and saying well yeah. yeah we know it does that but what does that mean in terms of the overall excitability okay. so but it'll take 20 years for that to get in Rangendale I'm afraid <laughs> but there we are <laughs> so just to step back a little because it's an area I'm not very familiar mm. with it's the cerebral cortex that we're looking at particularly is that right yeah it's it's not entirely a disease of the cortex but primarily it is um, there are subcortical areas, brain areas in the brain stem mm -hmm. that appear to be involved in, in generating elect epileptic activity, but it, it's mostly through their connections to the cortex anyway that they're doing it. But it may be that the actual initiation of a seizure mm -hmm. could arise at a brain stem site, but then it's how they project to the cortex that then alters what's happening in the cortex. Temporal cortex and temporal lobe epilepsies are the most prevalent okay. amongst um, humans. About 30-35% of all epilepsies of temporal lobe origin. And frontal cortex, occipital cortex back here is also, these are also areas that are, that are highly susceptible to generation of epilepsy, but it's not every area of cortex. Does the region of the cortex, does that affect the symptoms as we were talking earlier? Absolutely, yes, okay. absolutely. I mean, depending where the activity arises or spreads to, mm. um, which areas cortex become involved, then you know, the motor symptoms, you know, the movement of the arms yeah. and things in different seizures are because epileptic activity is in invading the motor areas of cortex that are responsible for controlling okay. your arms. So a lot of the behavioural symptoms depend on on the cortical areas that are involved and a lot of we talk about auras in epilepsy where, where yeah. patients before they have a seizure and the bit leading up to their seizures smell particular things see particular things um, and they again are related to the seizures beginning in the areas of cortex that control how we smell yeah. and how we see and hear you know so they're there they are these auras are very dependent on the site where they it's being generated, yes. And do we know much about what actually triggers a particular seizure? No, that's an interesting question as well. I mean, the obvious one is, you know, photosensitive epilepsy. You know, okay. you turn on the news every night and the newsreader will say, we're going to show you a clip and there may be some flash photography. Oh, okay. And that's essentially a warning to people who have photosensitive epilepsy, which can be triggered by repetitive, like, strobe lighting. Okay. Um, actually photosensitive epilepsies are not particularly common um, but it's something that people always associated with with triggering seizures um, and I, I mean I every month we get a 
whole list of new references from Epilepsy Research UK, um, which is basically a month's worth of any paper in the world just about that mentions epilepsy. And it's quite interesting just to scan through the, the clinical ones because there's always some example of case studies of, oh, this is an epilepsy that was triggered by okay. something or other. And there's all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff in there. Mm. You know, um, brushing your hair, for example. There are people who's, who repetitively brushing their mm. hair and that can trigger a seizure. You know, the strobe lighting one is an obvious one. There's uh, examples, quite a, a good, good body of evidence doing complex mental arithmetic, arithmetic can trigger seizures. Mm. And my feeling is with all of these things, or a lot of them, is that it's the repetition okay. that's important. That you start doing something repetitively and you, you start getting repetitive activity occurring in the, in the neurons, okay. which then, if they're susceptible, we'll then they, they lead on to an excessive synchrony and repetition of activity. And that's the key, isn't it? The synchrony. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's not widely accepted that that's yeah. what's happening, but it, it seems logical to me yeah. that it might be. Yeah. And it's the balance, really, between the excitatory and the inhibitory sort of signal stimuli yeah. that, that, yeah. that you're looking at yeah. and that does seem to, that when that goes awry and you get this excessive synchrony yeah. and that's what sort of triggers the thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's always been viewed as, quite simplistically, yeah. as, well, nerve networks are balanced. We always draw these pictures of seesaws with excitation yeah. inhibition, which I had in the lecture today. Um, and, you know, there's all kinds of levels at which that balance yeah. is exerted, but it's always been simplistically, well, if excitation goes up too much or inhibition goes down too much, mm -hmm. then the whole network switches to a repetitive state. Yeah. Um, and as I said towards the end of the talk, that there's been a lot of effort in recent years to say, well, it's, you know, that's way too simple. It's not mm. that simple. Um, and there are all kinds of things you have to factor in and layer into this sort of simplistic hypothesis mm. to actually realise what's really happening. Um, and I, yes, it is complex. Obviously, yeah. it's complex. But I think you know this whole simple view of it is actually still perfectly valid. Yeah. yeah. Because you can make it as complicated as you like, but at the end of the day, we know these things are are in some kind of balance, and that if you switch out of that balance, then you're going to get pathological activity occurring. Yeah. And to move on to some of the the data you were showing, you've looked at lots of different types of anti-epileptic mm. drugs yeah. and kind of characterised yeah. their activity. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yes, well we've, we've examined a range of drugs in the studies we've been doing and as I said, you know, what we wanted to do is step back a bit and say, yeah. you know, not so much what is the molecular target here, yeah. but what do they do overall? And we've used two approaches, first of all to record synaptic currents that are, are there all the time in these neurons. And this uh, is in brain slices? It's all done in brain slices, in rat brain slices, mm -hmm. yes. So, I mean, we don't work with human tissue. Um, so it's all done in, in rat brain slices in a dish. Yep. Um, but we can keep them alive quite happily in, in a dish for 10 or 12 hours if we want to. Um, so that we can record electrical activity in them mm. and we can look at that balance, that excitation and inhibition balance in different ways. And one way is to look at, as I said, that each neuron in that bit of tissue is continuously being excited and continuously mm. being inhibited simultaneously mm. by all the pathways that are making contact with it. And we can record those, that activity, by using um, what we call wholesale patch clamp. Okay. okay, so that allows us to record the little tiny currents that are associated with inhibition and excitation. And we've looked at different drugs to see how it changes the balance between them mm. in that scenario. And they, there's a whole range of things they do. Some of them increase the excitatory bit, um, some of them increase the inhibitory bit, some of them decrease both. And there's all sorts of thing, different things that they do. Um, so it, it, you know, using that approach, we found it very difficult to say, well, you know, overall they're doing, they yeah. should be doing the same thing because they don't look like they're doing the same yeah. thing. 
So we tried to find an, a, a better way or a different way of doing it, and we we adapted a technique that was published by a French group in 2004, whereby you just take the overall activity in a neuron and you can measure by a mathematical approach of extracting information from the potential in that neuron, you can actually, with a mathematical approach, extract the overall background inhibition and the overall background excitation. So these are the two arms of the seesaw, if you mm. like, um, that we can say we can record from this neuron for 10 minutes and that's all we need to do. And by mathematically varying, we need to know various characteristics of the right. cells, obviously, um, but, but we can extract a figure which sums all that background okay. activity for each neuron and simultaneously and we don't, you know, we don't, it's not a very invasive approach or anything, so the neurons are quite normal. Um, they're in a brain slice, obviously, but they're relatively normal and we can just get a figure for it and we can look how it changes. So again, this is, to be very simplistic, this is taking a, a rat brain, taking a really thin slice out of it, yeah. keeping it nice, alive, happy, warm, yeah. oxygenated, those yeah. sorts of things, and yeah. then sticking a, a tiny little bit of yeah. in, is that right? Yeah. In the original studies, we use a patch clamp pipette, which is a sort of fairly, relatively speaking, quite a fat one. Yep. And we and just we put it fat. on the membrane. Yes, yes, they fat. They are fat. <laughs> they sort of, they are fat shaped. You know, yep. they go down to a point, but they are very tubby. Um, and we suck onto the membrane, and we yep. seal onto the membrane with that, and we record the currents in there. With the second approach, where we globally estimate what's going on. That's an intracellular electrode where we put the electrode through the membrane okay. into the cell so the tip is inside the cell and the rest of it's outside and we can just record the potential across the membrane with that. Okay. Yeah, and that's, that's where we get our information from because it continuously fluctuates. And your kind of message really from that work has been that? The message is that it worked, <laughs> and that what we set out with with in mind was that w that the overall molecular targets mm -hmm. were important. It's important to know what they're doing yeah. at the molecular level, where whether they're targeting a particular channel or transmitter or what. Um, but overall, within terms of excitability within the network, it doesn't really matter because what they all do mm -hmm. is increase inhibition. Yeah at the expense of excitation. Okay. If you measure the ratio between the two, yeah. that ratio always goes up in favour of inhibition with every single drug we've tested. And it doesn't matter what they do in terms of the patch clamp experiments, okay. in that global change of excitability, they do exactly the same thing. One way or another, they do it in different ways, yeah. but the overall effect is that increased ratio in favour of inhibition. And every single drug we've tested fits with that. And every time that inhibition goes up, the overall ability of the cell to be excited goes down. Okay, and, and we think that's what's important in terms of, of the overall action of these drugs. And that's what we need to look for in new drugs. It doesn't, you know, we can say, oh, well, it doesn't, we don't have to force it to have a molecular target. Mm -hmm. We don't have to look at a specific molecular target. Let's just look and see what it does globally. And it's a much simpler approach okay. as well. So what's the, what's the way ahead? What's next? Well, for us, um, and I guess in general, uh, we've done all this in normal tissue. Of okay. course, so all the drugs we've tested, we've shown all these nice effects, we've got lots of nice data, mm -hmm. um, but it's all been in normal rat tissue. What we need to do is to do it in tissue that's pathologically demonstrating mm -hmm. epileptic activity. And we can do that in different ways. We can generate annual models of epilepsy in vivo. There are practical and ethical problems associated mm -hmm. with that. Um, so what we're actually trying to do is develop an in vitro model of epilepsy now, okay. which is to t again to take rat brain tissue, but mm -hmm. um, we can take slices from one rat, mm -hmm. put them in a culture situation, keep them alive for months, okay. several months, mm 
um, and then we can make we can ins give them an insult which will generate a chronic state of epilepsy within that slice and we can monitor it over months and see what the drugs do in pathologically epileptic tissue rather than just say, well, this happens in normal tissue, therefore it probably happens in epileptic patients. And so that's the next step for us, and I think that's, you know, that's what we're going to be doing over the next mm. three or four years. Well, that was really, really interesting, and thank you very, very much for your time. Well, thank you.